You're the business first here, Alan. Yeah. So, uh, all right, I guess I'll, I'll make the introduction here. I think everybody in the room is very, very familiar with Alan Pierce, who's an um, adjunct scientist here, the uh, chief editor of JASA, um, and has been around the halls here for, for quite a bit working with us. Um, <clears throat> we have a series which is on uh, about people who have been very important in the history of underwater acoustics and, and acoustics in general at Woods Hole which um, we're happy to have Alan to be part of. Um, <clears throat> there's um, This history actually is donated to the ASA, so it's going to their historical archives as well. So it's part of the... Oh, gee, ASA. I should have... So did you, I, should you have we, I should have scrubbed those remarks yes, I made well, about certain remarks, officers, yeah, uh, former officers. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> okay, okay, well... <laughs> so it's not just the locals. Yeah. <clears throat> but at any rate, Alan, um, Alan certainly is one of the more important people in our, our field. Uh, Alan's been uh, um, <clears throat> chief editor of JASA for the past 15 years. He's a gold medal winner in acoustics. Uh, he's authored a textbook which has tortured many students over the years uh, <clears throat> and taught, taught acoustics and done research for how many years, Alan? Since, uh, let's see. Well, you'll find out. 49. <laughs> so, so it's starting to look like a couple, couple no. few years. <laughs> So, at any rate, I think uh, without any much further ado, let me introduce uh, and say welcome to Alan Pierce and turn the floor over to him. Yeah, I guess I can s stay sitting. Um, That's fine. I think. Um, yeah. uh, now, this thing, you know, I supposed to do anything to turn on or? Just, no, it's just okay. Then you can all hear me. Anyway, um, I wasn't born in New Mexico, um, and um, but um, I spent some formative years there. I was actually born in Iowa. Now, I'm going to give you more or less an autobiography. I think that's what you want. Um, and we'll ask a few questions. And, um, okay, now, uh, the reason why I was in New Mexico was really my mother's health, but um, uh, my father uh, landed a job at White Sands Proving Ground, uh, and that was, um, we lived uh, actually on the base for one year, and then we lived in Las Cruces, a nearby town, uh, the other years during this period. Um, I was 12 years old when we came to New Mexico. This is an Arrow B um, yeah. uh, missile, which the Navy was real keen about in those days. They had a lot of captured U-2s and stuff like that. Um, this was long before NASA. Anyway, uh, I went to school. Uh, uh, everybody has to go to college, I guess. Uh, they don't have to. but um, And uh, you might get a kick out of the name of the club, the physics club at my Alma mater was the American Institute of Physics. Um, and, uh, <laughs> it wasn't American Physical Science. I think that's because we got um, Physics a Day for free. Um, anyway, um, at that time, I was the president of the club. And, you see, and the thing you'll notice, there's not very many people. I'm going to explain that to you. Um, um, this guy on the right over here um, is um, Richard Duncan. Um, uh, he taught uh, a course that he was brand new as assistant professor. He, he was a World War II vet, and he um, uh, later became the vice president of research of New Mexico, which became New Mexico State. And um, I guess Ken, Ken wanted to know what books we used. Uh, for some reason, this guy Weston, Francis Weston uh, Sears, he had a monopoly in that we used um, his book on mechanics, electromagnetism, his book on thermodynamics, his book on optics. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, I... Was that the Sears of Sears and Zemanski? Yes, yes. So that, that were the lower class books. The high yeah. class books were his name only. Um, and um, uh, this, uh, he, uh, when I, 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 I don't want to say it, but I was a little bit precocious. So I was taking this in my freshman year, but all my classmates were sophomores. Um, um, one of my classmates with this fellow here, he's a good friend of me, he's also in high school with me, Burke and Chang. Um, and uh, anyway, what happened in this school, this class, uh, you, you may find it a strange story. Uh, at the end of the first semester, Duncan gave um, 17 Fs, 1 D, 1 C, and 2 As. Um, okay. What a guy. Uh, now, so, uh, that, that, so that was what they called the Duncan drought. Um, so that's why uh, there weren't that many people in the picture before. Um, and um, now, 
somehow Duncan took a shine to me, and he actually gave me a little job. And, um, um, and uh, he said this new book had just come out by, by this, some guys who really knew what their stuff. And um, there was actually there were two books. Um, and um, what he um, suggested, we spend two hours a day working through these books. And uh, so um, and, um, this guy plays a little role later. Uh, so, so actually, um, as an undergraduate, I worked through at least uh, a good portion of the first volume uh, Morrison Feshbach. Uh, we didn't make rapid progress. We argue about the equations, maybe, um, uh, and it took us maybe, um, maybe three pages a day or so. It's slow. Anyway, um, I guess it's because of Sears and Morse, and I had the impression that everything was at MIT. And I, and I later discovered I made a big mistake. Not necessarily, but uh, so when I went to MIT for my graduate studies, and I was there between 57 and 61. Now, um, my thesis advisor, um, I took all sorts of courses, of course, but um, uh, was Laszlo Tisza. And um, he was a Hungarian and a um, fairly bright guy, although I wouldn't give him an A for being a thesis advisor. But um, he. Um, uh, it turns out, I learned this long later, but he used to quote Landau to me a lot. He uh, actually had studied with Lev Landau, the Landau Lipschitz guy. And, um, and uh, he, he went from hung Hungary to there. And I guess he had communist le leanings in his youth. Um, he didn't have them later because um, when he was in Russia, the regime put uh, Landau in jail. And so he uh, came back to Hungary and finished his doctorate there. But basically, the thesis and everything was. Landau's idea. There's some people that think that maybe um, Landau got a Nobel Prize and maybe Tisa should have shared it with him, but he didn't feel that way. Anyway, the thesis uh, topic I wrote was on sort of a quantum mechanical thing. Um, Tisa had a, what I would now regard as a crazy idea about explaining superconductivity. This is around the time that Bardeen and Cooper and Schrieffer had published their famous paper, and he sort of ignored that. But um, there was an old paper by uh, this guy up here is Max Born. This is the young J.R. Oppenheimer, and this is the older J.R. Oppenheimer. And of course, he got a lot of notoriety in later life. Um, um, but they had written a paper which, um, uh, which, um, which was, had actually a very significant effect in my life, even though I'm not very proud of my thesis. Now, um, OK, so. Um, uh, as I was getting out of school, I had to think about a job. And this gets back to the dear old American Institute of Physics, where I was still getting um, physics today. And uh, they ran a full page ad, this RAND Corporation. Uh, and they listed all the famous people on the board of directors. And one of them was Morse. And Morse was also on my thesis committee. So, um, so I said, it can't be that bad a place. And um, my Girlfriend at the time, later my wife, thought, gee, it's too cold in Massachusetts. Let's go send this warm. So this was Santa Monica, California, where it was. And so the Rand years, two years there. Um, now, uh, turns out uh, this is somewhat of a tremendous place. Um, the guy I worked for was a guy named Albert Ladder. Um, and he, I was in the physics department. And um, when I interviewed there, I was introduced to this guy who impressed me a lot because he had a suit on his tie. That was Edward Teller. Um, and Teller and um, Ladder were big buddies. Um, and, uh, and they co-authored a book on our nuclear future. And they had um, fought um, tooth and nail against the arms ban, uh, and the testing ban. Um, but, um, but they lost anyway. But um, anyway, um, when um, I, I interviewed there. Ladder made this, um, the, the, this comment. The last people we hired were from Harvard. <laughs> Students of Swinger didn't work out, so we thought we might would try something from MIT. I, I was the guy from MIT. I guess they figured that guys at MIT were a little more practical. So go back here. Um, anyway, um, when I first came there, I said, well, you've got to have something to do. He said, you should think about a lot of problems. But one thing is, you got to understand that you got to work on practical problems. and um, all these guys, um, well, they were talking about designing nuclear hand grenades in the hall and stuff like that. And, uh, and they sort of sneered any problem that didn't involve Planck's constant. Um, so, um, so nobody wanted to do this acoustics problem. 
And um, anyway, so I, I, I was the youngest guy, and, and I was, there was one other guy that was, was a student at Gelman. He was about my age. Um, but the rest of them all about 10 years older than me. So, uh, um, so I was very junior. And uh, anyway, the source of these acoustic waves, as you can gather up there, uh, were bobs. OK, now, uh, it, it, was, it, was, it was really a, a, a fun place to work. Um, one of the guys I met who um, came in a weekly, um, and I came fairly well acquainted him with a guy named Milton Pleasant. If you know anything about physical acoustics, they're always talking about the Pleasant. Um, Let's see, uh, equation, I forget what it was, but anyway, he had an equation for bubbles, and um, uh, he was a pretty smart guy. And um, and in the lunch hour, uh, what they do, and um, I came real, relatively good at this, they played this blindfold chess, um, where, um, and of course, um, they were worried about, you know, uh, outsmarting the Russians, and you didn't know what the Russians were going to do, so it seemed more realistic to have chess. We didn't know what the moves were with the other guy, and so as uh, we used to play that, and you, you needed you you, uh, you needed um, uh, two chess boards, and then you had a um, a barrier in the middle, and you need uh, one guy to be the referee to tell you um, tell the other guy what the other guy's pieces were. So anyway, um, so. Uh, uh, I must say, um, no, I had a reasonable physics background, but I didn't know any acoustics of that kind. Um, uh, so, um, so I went out and got Morse's book, it was, and I didn't like it. And then Kinsler and Fry, I found I could work the problems without understanding anything. Uh, and um, <laughs> so, um, so the books I read uh, at that time was Landau and Lipschitz, Fluid Mechanics. Prakowski um, uh, pressed me a lot. He wrote a book on waves and layered media, which just come out, and that was. Uh, and then Lamb's Hydra. And then there's all sorts of other uh, uh, papers I read. Um, and, and anyway, it was um, uh, the guys that uh, ran it didn't really rush me or anything. Um, I did write one paper during that period. Um, uh, and it was sort of interesting because um, um, and, uh, one of the Russian papers wasn't translated into English, but by a guy who was the, uh, a member of the Russian Academy of Science, the Soviet web, anyway, anyway, he had done roughly the same problem. He had a whopping error, which I delightfully pointed out in my article. Um, and um, um, I did write, the, the real thing I did there was classified, and I thought, and ha Ladder was pretty happy with it, but, um, uh, um, and uh, I didn't start out with uh, the Schrodinger equation, anything like that. Uh, it was, it was, and but I, I saw something that had been puzzling for a while. Anyway, um, I don't know if you guys recognize this picture. Um, he, he, he's still in the news. Um, anybody have a guess who he is? No? Oh, we're in Dyson? Huh? No? That's not Dyson, is it? No, no, no. Uh, yeah, his name is Daniel Ellsberg. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, th this happened after I left, uh, but. Um, Daniel Ellsberg did a job on the Rand Corporation, so all the guys I worked with uh, went out and started their own company right after that, uh, because um, they couldn't. The, the government, at least the guys they dealt with, uh, which were uh, really hush hush types, um, couldn't trust the Rand Corporation to keep secrets anymore. So, um, so and actually, I think they got rich in the process. But um, anyway, uh, it turns out my wife. Uh, uh, was, uh, to a certain extent, uh, that was the best job I ever had was the one that ran. But my wife hated uh, California, and uh, she decided that cold weather wasn't all that bad, so we had to go back to Massachusetts. So I took a job in an outfit called Avco. And um, uh, Avco was an interesting place. What they were really concerned with was reentry vehicles, and, um, and uh, they also worked on the lunar lander for the uh, Apollo mission. Uh, one of the uh, it was a, uh, one of their uh, consultants, a guy named um, Hans Beta, and he came in every so often, and I met him several times. So he had so ideas, and he'd make sage comments. Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, um, my experience at Rand uh, more or less uh, wired me in to get uh, some funding from the Air Force. This is from Air Force Cambridge Research Laboratories uh, at. Um, um, up in Bedford, Massachusetts, and um, they they were 
concerned about these big waves that were, came around uh, from the uh, nuclear explosions. Um, they funded me for about 16 years, and it was a, a nice long run. Um, 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 people were interested in the subject when I first started, but by the time I, the last contract was over, nobody cared. The, the cold weather war wasn't all that cold and, um, or hot or whatever. So, uh, but these waveforms, uh, they, they were, uh, the periods were like minutes, and uh, they would travel. You would have somebody throw off some big bomb up north of Russia, and they'd go around the Earth a couple of times and still be there. Okay, so. Uh, one of the guys that, and I, I hope you won't mind me dropping all these names, one of the guys um, that had written on this subject was a fellow named Frank Press, um, who um, uh, one time he was head of the National Academy of Sciences, and he was science advisor to the president. And um, anyway, Press had written um, a paper in which um, uh, he had um, uh, this is the atmos this is the sound speed in the atmosphere or the, actually the temperature is was yet to um, but um, they had broken the um, atmosphere down into layers and they um, and they and they had to worry about gravity in, in addition to compressibility and some guy was pretty eminent wrote an article and said that they're all wrong they're not doing what there is so um, I made uh, press I think a friend for life at least he referred to me as a defender I wrote a paper in a journal which proved that what he did was correct and the limit to the layers got thin, so. Okay, now, uh, this is, um, during this AFCO time, um, I wrote this paper, which uh, is now known, uh, I wasn't necessarily thinking about underwater acoustics at the time, although it's, uh, it's been cited 235 times. Um, it, um, and, and my, um, Studying the born oppenheimer approximation paid off, um, and that um, I simply applied it to, um, which I guess you could say it to, uh, to underwater cruise, any stratified medium. The medium had to vary in the horizontal direction. Um, uh, and um, anyway, a lot of people picked it up. Um, but the thing is, they didn't pick it up very quickly. Um, it was, took about 10 years before people recognized. But the guy who seemed to catch on to it first, uh, uh, the quickest, was this guy. I wonder if any of you know who he is. Um, that's Berkowski. Right? Yeah, Berkowski. He gave a sub talk in, the, uh, in 65 at, at ICA, and he was referred, referred to almost stratified me. And I went up and talked to him at the, at the reception afterwards. And he, and he said, oh, you're that Pierce. You're the one that's working on bombs. Uh, and um, <laughs> so, uh, anyway, so anyway, that was it. Okay, now, how did I get to academia? Okay, well, out of the blue, uh, I get an invitation uh, to come to Berkeley and give a seminar, and they paid my own way. And um, and uh, and so when I went there, this guy, um, his name was Paul Nagy, he was the head of the Applied uh, Mechanics Division of the Mechanical Engineering Department at Berkeley. And he um, basically said that they had an opening, he wanted me to apply. So I went back home and discussed with my wife, said, no, we've been to California, I'll try someplace else. So, um, so I said, well, I guess I must be a mechanical engineer now. I didn't, hadn't thought of myself of that. But um, so I wrote a letter to the uh, Mechanical Engineering Department at MIT, and um, this guy replied. He he was the uh, Nagy's counterpart in the mechanical. He wasn't the department head, and he said, "Yeah, we have an opening, and we're interested." And so that so I went to um, MIT for a while. Um, so who was that person? Huh? Oh, that's uh, Stephen uh, H. Crandall. I forget what the. Uh, oh, Crandall. Yeah, Crandall. He was. Um, um, he, he was sort of my boss at MIT. Um, there was another guy who uh, I couldn't, uh, uh, I, I didn't want to include his picture or name with Dan Hartog, but um, um, anyway, Crand Crandall was this, he been behind me. Uh, so anyway, um, um, it was a little uh, strange, I mean, because I didn't really know much uh, mechanical engineering, um, but um, um, I, I don't know whether it's by design or what, I taught 
at least two-thirds of all the required undergraduate courses while I was at MIT. I taught the one on strength of materials, or they call the mechanics of solids. I taught the one on material science. I taught the one on fluid mechanics. And I taught uh, uh, one on uh, design. And let's see, there was, uh, um, anyway, the, 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 I did a lot of teaching, uh, but it, it was fairly fun, and I learned a lot in the process. And, um, and I said that people are not going to believe I'm a mechanical engineer, so I uh, applied and became a registered professional engineer. Now, um, th that, that's what you know, engineers are supposed to do, and it's not a bad idea. And it was sort of funny because the, the list of references I had uh, and what we're, we're all, you know, big deals, um, full professors at MIT and all that. Anyway, they gave me my license, so. <laughs> okay, now, uh, one is, uh, I still was going on with this nuclear blast stuff, and um, I came up <coughs> with a method where you could look at a waveform, and without even um, 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 knowing the path it's taken and everything, you measured, um, all the waveforms looked about the same. Um, uh, um, and there, you measured the period, uh, the, the time between the first and second peaks, and you measure the net amplitude of those two things. And uh, you also have to know how far you are. And um, I shot it off to nature, and the guys at nature thought it was worth putting on the cover um, of nature. Um, nowadays, they make a big deal. I, and to me, it, I actually published three papers in Nature in that era, and it didn't seem that hard. But um, anyway, um, what I did, uh, oh, this is the data of showing on all of this, and um, um, well, anyway, I, I got into trouble. Um, that um, I, um, it was all right to say how big the Russian explosions were. Um, but it wasn't okay to say how big the U.S. explosions were. Uh, and um, and I, I heard just the last meeting that that caused all sorts of ripples and everything. Um, and, um, and the problem was, I, what I'd do is I'd get, I would submit first and then get permission later. You know, so, uh, but um, Nature published this in three weeks, and I didn't have time. So anyway, now, okay, now. Here's another thing that I got into when I was at MIT that um, it, uh, it was, I, I decided that, um, well, maybe other people decided for me that bombs weren't necessarily all that politically correct. Um, so um, um, around uh, the um, mid-60s, um, sonic booms were a big deal. And, um, and the Congress was debating like mad whether or not um, they give money or allow Boeing to make an SST. And, um, NASA was running by this guy um, who later knew, got to know quite well. It's Harvey Hubbard. Uh, he was at NASA Langley. And um, the thing which about this, uh, some of these booms, um, they should look like this. Um, that, that's, the way they, that's the way they're supposed to look. Um, and that's the, why they look like this is a little bit of a story, but not that story. But then a certain percentage of them had these big spikes uh, on them. And, and, um, it was sort of curious. I think, why should it be spending? Why does it go down like this and go? But it was, they were both like this. And um, anyway, I explained. So that, that's, um, um, and I don't think anybody else explained it better. Um, and um, it basically had to do with um, that, you know, the way these things that go through turbulence or so forth, they ripple. And the places where the concave inwards, they um, shock up. And, um, and when the, and the others, they sort of flatten out. But uh, you have diffraction, and the uh, high frequencies um, don't diffract. The low frequencies do. And so um, the high, high frequencies are basically um, uh, magnified according to geometric frequencies. The low frequencies aren't, and that's why you get the spike. So anyway, that was it. OK, another guy I met well, had, well, has some um, influence um, was um, a guy named Maurice Bio. He came to MIT and gave a seminar, um, and um, and he said, I, and he asked to see me, uh, which I was I was I was very uh, um, thing because he's he also worked on uh, these uh, they call acoustic gravity waves and um, and um, 
And I asked him, he was writing a lot of books at the time, and I asked him why he was writing all the books, and he said, because um, it's either you write them now or you don't write them, uh, you know, it's too late. So anyway, um, that was it. Okay, then, um, um, next I go to Georgia Tech. Um, that was in 73, and, um, I, and um, turns out that I got a lot more money in, uh, at Georgia Tech, and um, it was... Um, it was a nice place, um, at least at the time, um, and it was um, anyway. It was it was different, and uh, so um, it was uh, during the years when I was at Georgia Tech that I wrote this book. Uh, the book uh, taught me. Uh, it took me about seven years to write, um, and I worked on it pretty hard. And uh, Maybe it's a mistake to start writing the book, but once you got into it, uh, it was you, you reached a point where um, you had so much time invested, you had to finish the damn thing. So um, uh, it, it came out around 1981. The publisher was McGraw Hill, and um, um, okay. So and then this little bit of a thing is that um, this is from Google Scholar. It's, Quite a Google Scholar, I, I was a little mingled because there's, there's uh, two editions. One was the McGraw Hill edition. Anyway, it's been cited 1640 times, and that's fairly respectable. Um, on uh, on Google, uh, on Amazon, it gets five stars, um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and uh, right and it, right now it's being sold by Google. Say so that's another sort point I could go on, but um, <laughs> uh, but nevertheless. Um, uh, it, uh, Although uh, the books that uh, Cusco Science reprinted and sells, it is the leading seller, bestseller of all the books that currently sell. Okay, now, um, some of you guys may know this guy. Did anybody know Just him? Just when Joe. Yes, 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 yes. okay. Joe. Well, um, the young Joe. Uh, this is, uh, well, uh, he was a lot younger then. Uh, he was um, uh, uh, somehow uh, the Chinese government or somebody had given him a pile of money so he'd come to the uh, U.S. or some sort of cultural exchange or whatever, and uh, uh, and Peter Rogers had, who we'll, we'll talk about a little bit, and said, oh, we've got to have this guy, Joe. Uh, and so um, I, I had this um, grant from NASA to study about diffraction of sound over hills, and um, the um, the graduate student we had went bottom up, and we were pressed, and uh, and so Joe was uh, became my graduate student. Um, on this project, so that goes back to my association with Joe. Um, oops, no, why did we go back? Okay, so anyway, that was um, yeah, so, um, uh, so he, and he he did a good job. And um, um, anyway, um, um, oh, over the years we had a mass, a pretty good group at Georgia Tech, and um, um, uh, um, I, um some of you may know um, Jerry Ginsburg. Um, he, he came there soon after me, and um, uh, he uh, said that my being there helped persuade him to come there. He left Purdue and came there. Uh, Peter Rogers it is a little bit of an awkward story. Um, he was my contract monitor at ONR, and um, and I went to the Acoustical Society and posted this thing that Georgia Tech was looking for faculty. Uh, the reason why uh, I posted it because they were going to give a free IBM. Um, uh, PC, whoever was an instrumental, bring a new faculty member. And so, uh, <laughs> and so uh, Peter approaches me and says, uh, "Say I'm here with that job." Anyway, so I got the IBM PC and I lost my contract monitor. <laughs> so I don't know what it was. Um, uh, uh, Marty came as a student and she, um, she, and she went back. She was a recent president of the ASA, uh, and she's now back at Georgia Tech. Eve Berthelow was um, recruited. Uh, from Texas, and uh, we wrote several papers together, uh, and then there's Joe. This character up here, uh, his um, name is Wu. Uh, when I first met him, his name was not um, Sean, but uh, he decided to, to, have some, to Irishize his name, so it's Sean Wu. He's um, some sort of distinguished professor. Anyway, he was my student, and um, also Jerry's. Um, that was quite a while ago. Anyway. Okay, now, why did I go to Penn State? Uh, it's, it's a great place. Um, okay, um, well, um, 
my well, my, you know, I can't I hate to keep white penny for it all this, but, um, <laughs> uh, but uh, and again, it's hard hard to understand your wife anyway. But um, um, I thought she was tired of the South, and so and also, Penn State had a carrot. They had a, an endowed chair, and it was the uh, first endowed chair that, that existed for anything in acoustics. And um, this guy here, uh, Leonard. Um, he was filthy rich, uh, and uh, he was, um, uh, and, he, and he had a company on the West Coast called Parsons. Um, and um, uh, the, the, my former department head became dean of Penn State, and he negotiated this guy. This is in the early days, to up the ante to, to endow a chair, and then then the, he recruited me to fill it. Um, and later on, they got more and more money out of this guy Leonard. Um, uh, and then he gave him a building. Um, and one of the ways they got money out of him, I don't know, anybody recognize this guy? Yeah, we, we know who he is. Okay, anyway, <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, what they do is they have these dinners, and they have me, uh, the um, guy, and they have Leonard, and they have the president, and they have this guy, and they give the, and they really put the bite on Leonard. And, um, mm -hmm. and he was a really loyal. And so, uh, so the question was, why are they giving money to these kids? And uh, he said, my kids got enough money. So, so I said, I'll give it uh, some place to account. So I gave it to Penn State. So anyway, uh, this time I got involved with the ASME, which um, um, and I, and I'm sort of pooping out kind of things I want to talk about. Um, but the ASME, I gave several papers. And this was the age era where um, we got into uh, what was called fuzzy structures. and. Um, and explained all sorts of things about uh, why uh, the attenuation when you uh, when a sound beam hit a submarine was a lot higher than expected. Um, anyway, so then okay now now you say why the hell did I leave Penn State? Um, now uh, well the thing was that um, turned out my wife really didn't like Penn State, so I, <laughs> and, uh, and she uh, she was. Uh, and um, this case, uh, you know, she really was, it was clear. Um, now, she was a BU alumnus, and uh, she spotted an ad in, uh, uh, in um, well, I, think, I think it was um, mechanical engineer or, or something that they were looking for an apartment head, uh, the apartment of mechanical engineer or aerospace mechanical engineering, and then it was at BU, and then um, so I, I applied, and, um, and um, I got the job. And uh, to a certain extent, this uh, put a lot of damping on research, because it even had a department head. I guess uh, some of you guys have been to park. No, it, it's really a drain on your time. Um, I, um, I did hire a lot of good people uh, while I was there. Um, and um, so anyway, it was, uh, and anyway, Beal, um, I think, um, yeah, all right. Um, it's, it had a, it's having a hard time lately because it hired a former uh, provost of MIT to be its president. But um, <laughs> uh, uh, and, um, he's the guy, same guy as responsible for the demise of ocean engineering at MIT. But anyway, um, um, okay. So I thought I would sort of wind this up um, and talk about some of the um, things I did with Bill Carey. Uh, Bill Carey. Um, uh, came came um, rel relatively late. I think it was um, uh, he, he joined us in '99. Um, he came up to a, a, a SA meeting and introduced himself. And over the years, I said, "Gee, that's a great guy." And so we, um, 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 uh, um, um, and so um, uh, and, and I also had this stint as a, a, a sabbatical here at Woods Hole and. Um, and, um, and somehow I said, well, i got to do some ocean acoustics now and, um, uh, and so forth. And he sold me on the problem of sediments and, um, and, and the attenuation of sediments. And it turned out it was a rather controversial thing. Uh, it still is, um, um, but um, uh, at least um, we, and we never really got it all properly written up. This, this thing turned out to be a JASL paper. Um, and um, we did... Um, Explained that the attenuation was really associated uh, as, as sediments, the pebbly type sediments. Um, it was associated with viscosity in there. 
Uh, then um, um, the problem was that if you did that, um, you came up with the thing that the attenuation uh, should go as the frequency to the 2.0. And all the measurements showed it was frequency to, to, to something less than 2.0. And so um, this is another thing which I th think we haven't really written up, but I'm pretty sure it's good. Um, we're explaining why it isn't um, uh, 2.0, and uh, why it is 1.8, is because all the uh, inverse techniques have left out sh the shear in the bottom. And if you put in the shear, um, it very neatly uh, drops it to order of 1.8. So, okay, now, um, this is one of my things which I'm uh, currently on, um, and I'm taking it off. Remember I mentioned B.O. before, and he's long dead, I mean, uh, nobody lives forever. Uh, but um, B.O. came up with a model for um, uh, porous medium about um, Oh, 1953 or so, a long time ago, was um, and um, and uh, his papers have been cited uh, about as much as my book, and um, they have been cited, 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 and there's, and they've been cited uncritically. Now, uh, he it had a good idea. I'm not going to say that, but um, he claimed that, um, uh, well, the the theory. I, I don't think he really hammered on it, but it didn't waffle either. Um, uh, that there was a second propagating wave in porous media, and so on. So I'm going to crusade to prove that he's wrong. He was wrong. Although, um, and, and I just accept another stupid paper of jazz, um, which, um, uh, uh, because I felt sorry for the guy, some Japanese guy who probably believes everything in the West has written, and it, it was about the, um, the second wave and the porous media. And, but anyway, so that, that's, that's part of it. Now, Okay, now now we come down to the editor in chief business. Now, uh, okay, now uh, in retrospect, um, I made a big mistake, but um, uh, I I never should have done this. And um, but now I'm in so deep I can't dig out um, that um, the um, the job came up. Uh, and it's just like the uh, acoustics today editor business. It came up and. Um, and this was a job where um, normally um, you, you got it, and it may not be true in my case, but you, you died. When you, when you left the job, you died. Um, and so, was, um, and, um, and, um, so um, uh, and I, I thought I was a little young in 1999. I said, I really don't want to uh, uh, take the job. Um, but then um, uh, the guy that sort of my role model was. Um, this guy, R. Bruce Lindsay, um, he was a, uh, uh, during my early years when I was selling him papers, he was the editor of JASA. And um, he, uh, he was the editor for 28 years. And, um, and he lasted until he was 85. Um, and and, and uh, he died with his boots on. I guess he was chairing some session at AS, some ASA meeting. And, he killed over, and that was the end of the end. But, um, uh, anyway, um, and, um, the, um, and um, in my case, there was another guy in between, uh, Martin, and he had a terminal case of cancer. That's why they were looking for a replacement. And um, he died in between the time they interviewed me and several other guys. And um, and I was offered a position, and I was our position, and. Um, uh, and I accepted it. it. It paid a little bit, but not very much. And um, anyway, um, um, things go on. I thought one thing I mentioned to you um, is um, uh, some of you have been up there. We have a, uh, this is my doing, um, this is a long story, but we have a, um, an office um, which is um, in, on Route 6A and West Barstable. Our office is right there. Um, Oops, nope, I can't do it. Then um, anyway, the um, and since uh, the office um, was rented roughly um, oh, a year and a half ago, we hired Mary Gillamet um, as a publications manager a year ago, and Jessica Gillamet was hired in December. Unfortunately, Jessica um, is leaving us um, 
and you think, you think, gee, what a wonderful job and all that. Well, I learned some, I guess if you, all of you live on the Cape, so you probably are sympathetic to that. If you're a young, unmarried person, uh, and you live on the Cape, um, it's great in summer. Uh, but in the dead of winter, it's not all that great. So um, Jessica wants to go up to Boston. Uh, she doesn't really have a job yet, but we're looking for somebody who um, uh, doesn't mind uh, being uh, lonely in the dead of winter on Cape Cod. <laughs> and, uh, okay, uh, this is our last thing, which Ken can talk about. Um, uh, we applied uh, for a trademark for, uh, say, we have these books, and um, you saw one of them is mine, which is uh, the ESA is selling. Um, but we felt that um, and, um, the Books Plus Committee, and, um, and I was on that, so I came with the, as the current chair, felt that the ASA really can't publish books, especially new books. So we, mine was a reprint, and so it wasn't that big a deal. But um, we had to bring a partner with somebody, and so on. Um, uh, the Springer. Now, this turns out to be not as clean cut as it should be, um, but um, um, no, another thing I should show you is that um, I'm currently the acting editor of Acoustic Today, that the editor just died. We're looking for a new one, uh, but in the meanwhile, this, the magazine has to go out, and I want to have a big news article about this and um, that, um, and currently, um, I've been told to put that on hold, and a number of reasons I don't quite understand, but uh, with a little luck, um, the next issue of Cruise of the Day, which will be the July issue, which will come out in September, um, uh, we'll, um, we'll have uh, a story about this. Okay, then I'm going to stop. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone want to ask questions? I have a question on some of the early slides. You had pictures of, and you didn't identify all the people. Oh, oh I'm I sorry. assume in the, like, which one was you in the? Oh, oh, that was oh, yeah, that's a good that's the first like, one. Maybe it's just well, my guess. glasses. Yeah, go back to the second, whatever it was, second one. Let's see, I got um, slides. Slides yeah. okay, Bob. Okay now. Okay. There. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> The, uh, yeah. the, 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 yeah, uh, the skinny guy word. there, yeah. that was yeah. me. That's, that's the one I would have yeah. guessed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and um, <laughs> um, 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 one of the things that you notice, uh, which kind of funny, you know, cause, you know, make a big deal about women and, and, and physics and so forth, we were about half and half of those days. Uh, the, um, the, the women um, uh, seemed to survive the dunk and drop more than the, the rest of the guys. So, um, 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 is this school ha currently exists with a new name, right? Yes. Um, new Mexico Tech or something? Yeah, New Mexico uh, State University. Oh, yeah. oh New Mexico State. Oh, that's New Mexico State? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. and uh, Las Cruces? Um, it's um, in Las Cruces. No, it's out in the, it's the suburb. But um, okay. um, another thing I never thought about um, at the time, um, we had, um, I think, the highest percentage of Hispanics of mm -hmm. any um, university of Britain major university in the country. Um, um, one of my classmates, who's not in this picture, um, um, went off to Berkeley and got his PhD, and I let, later saw he was president of the Society of Hispanic Physicists. Uh, um, 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 and those um, are undergraduate. Yeah, uh, right, right, yeah. yeah Ken? Well, here you were at college studying physics, yeah. however, uh, that you were there also had a background and maybe a story, and I was uh, curious in some of your formative educational experiences as in high school. Uh, uh, was there something you read, or was it a course that you took? Uh, uh, well, there was a culture sort of in the thing that um, the thing to be, this was, um, you know, uh, White Sands is over the hill and um, so forth, and um, New Mexico had a uh, funny thing that it had perhaps the highest uh, percentage of PhDs in the uh, country. I mean, it didn't have very people. And um, in a long strip along um, uh, going from Las Cruces all the way up to Los Alamos, they were, it was really um, 
quite researchy and so forth. But right. you know, what a surprise. Yes, yeah, the uh, <laughs> those all of uh, yeah, yeah, continue yeah, up the yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, I applied for a summer job at Los Alamos and got turned down. Um, I think it's because they didn't they weren't experimentalists and um, I wasn't quite that um, so but um yeah. Um but um uh, my, actually I can uh, uh, I, when I was uh, high school, I uh, thought oh, I'll, I'll become a mechan well, mechanical engineer. And um, my father um, worked at White Sands. They talked to all the engineers at White Sands and uh, and so forth. And said, "Now, now he's a physicist." And so, <laughs> so, I, so that's why I made it through. Although I, I didn't, I didn't. I thought mechanical engineering was kind of cool. Is there a reason that you didn't go into academia right away? Did you was um, that a decision you consciously made to work for private companies? Or? Um, um, yeah, I guess it was. Um, uh, I think with money. Uh, <laughs> that, um, um, and that um, 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 this school wrote a, wrote a letter to me and offered me a position as assistant professor when I got out of MIT. And um, I think the salary was something like sixty six thousand five hundred, and um, the Rand Corporation paid me twelve thousand. Um, 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 and um, uh, and one of the things that uh, my grand regrets that the guy that uh, approached me wanted to hire me um, was a guy named Walter Cohn. Uh, he was at um, uh, UC San Diego, and. Um, and I was sort of interested. I never got the point of negotiating. It's supposed to be meeting with some APS meeting. And then Cohn, about 10 years later, got a Nobel Prize. And I, I said, Jesus, well, well anyway, you go one way and, uh, and that's it. So, and, so. Um, anyway. In which of the environments that you've worked in would you say offered the, the most uh, Stimulating environment in terms of research. Um, I say it's been downhill all the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you're here. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, no, uh, the, 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 uh, actually, the Rand Corporation. Uh, well, of course, uh, Daniel Ellsworth put the skids to it, uh, but um, uh, they um, they had all these um, Nobel Prize. Winners coming as consultants. I met Murray Gelman there, and um, and they had their first crack at all the problems that DOD wanted on. Of course, they were mm -hmm. mostly classified, but um, and they had this uh, you know this uh, attitude that um, uh, that the physicists could solve the problems of the world. So they um, and then they take any old problem and they would they somehow come up with an answer, and um, um, and, it, and it was kind of fun. Um, yeah. Uh, I've got a bigger related question. Uh, you must have had some contact with Jason. Who? The Jasons? Yeah. Yes. Um, can, you t can you tell us anything? Oh, well, yeah. That, I think that happened. Um, um, and I want to say what that is for people who may not know. Okay, Jason's. Okay. Um, um, uh, it's sort of a, it's a synonym for Golden Fleece. Um, <laughs> no, it, it, it was a special organization um, that at, at, um, at the end of World War II, um, there was a special committee uh, appointed by, uh, I, think, I think they reported to the Secretary of Defense, I'm not sure. Um, and um, the first chair was a guy named Hans Beta, and, uh, they, um, and he gathered up all these uh, Super physicists or so forth, um, who, um, who who were sort of like grand, only more so, and that they um, uh, they they get well-paid summer jobs, um, and they would um, study problems that were assigned to them by the uh, Department of Defense and the various um, agencies like ONR. They would go to the Jasons and say. Um, we have this problem. I wonder if you could uh, sort of oversee it, look at it, and say so. Um, um, one of the guys um, at O and R during uh, the years of, um, was a guy 
named uh, Jeff Main, uh, who incidentally had been a research system as an undergraduate at uh, Georgia Tech. But uh, Jeff Main was great for sizing up the Jasons, and so um, he got a, a meeting set up, um, and it was um, the Jasons uh, were at then sort of housed with SAIC in uh, La Jolla. And, um, uh, and the SAIC had this beautiful building. Um, Prospect, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and so, um, so uh, and a bunch of guys um, came in. The Jasons uh, were there, and, um, and, and um, there, were, there were a couple of the young guys I thought were smart asses. Oh, excuse me, yeah, but, um, uh, <laughs> but um, um, the, the one guy uh, that, that, that seemed very bright, but he was smoking uh, constantly, and they kept yeah, going back and forth. I'm trying to remember his um, yeah, huh? Dashing? Yeah, dashing. Yeah, dashing. yeah, yeah. And there's the a light the corners or the edges of styrofoam cups. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, but uh, but he, he, he was ex he was extremely uh, <laughs> he was extremely attentive. Uh, and there was one little guy that uh, never said anything. And I looked at him and said, um, um, "You must be Freeman Dyson." He said, "Yes." And uh, <laughs> so. Um, it turned out at the same time, Lyle was giving a short course at Penn State, and I, I read a book about uh, the two guys. They were classmates at uh, some Winchester school in England. Now, they, they, um, supposedly, they um, competed with each other all the time, and, um, and that helped make them both go to wherever it's anyway. So. Does, does that is that related at all with your transitioning into ocean acoustics? Because between Dyson and Monk and and Flatte and Dashin and all these Jason guys all doing writing papers in JASA and yeah, on yeah. ocean acoustics. I was wondering if that... Uh, well, that, that was one of the earlier assignments. Um, right. Um, the, um, uh, the problem that uh, they were... Um, okay, the, the question that uh, seemed to be um, rather prominent at that time, and at least the, um, um, the Navy had thrown a lot of money at it, was um, figuring out um, the, the scattering of sound from submarines. Uh, and um, and, I, and I, I think it was more than just uh, saying, is there some, some weird thing there in the middle of the thing? Because um, you know the, um, uh, the British killed a lot of whales during the Falkland War. Um, but they thought there were submarines, uh, but um, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so um, so that was, and so the Navy uh, threw a lot of money at it. and R did, and they had a um, Ira divers working on the problem, and John um, uh, uh, at MIT, and they had a group um, at Stanford and so forth, and um, um, uh, um and I I I'd come up. From, well, it was not completely um, my idea, but um, well, the idea of what they call fuzzy structures, that um, when you hit something, um, that uh, it doesn't matter what's inside it. You just have a lot of little resonators, and they suck up the energy, and they hold it long enough for it to be died out. So um, the, um, uh, the object looks to be um, uh, more absorbing than, than you would think it would be. So. Not a hard surface. Um, anyway, the Jason was uh, talked about that. Okay. So you were already doing it when you when you were. Oh yeah, no, no, they picked that. It wasn't. That, it yeah, that yeah. structural acoustics. Right? Yeah, 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 that was called structural acoustics. Um, it, it died um, long before ocean acoustics at ONR. Um, so, um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <coughs> Can solve that ask one question. Yeah. Which which piece of work, which contribution of yours, did you think was like kind of the most novel and interesting? Or the old art. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the one I'm working on now. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> no, I, no, no, it's, uh, no, it's it, it, it must be these things are fun. No, that's uh, not uh, particular. No, I'm not a particular. Um, no. Yeah. Are you going to write any more books? Yes. Um, we go back to this. Uh, and this goes down. Uh, down. Uh, okay. Now. Okay. Now. Uh, I want you to write another one. Uh, to. Uh, I want. Um, I want uh, all of you to write. This. Um, now. Okay. Now. 
Actually, I think I sent um, uh, Springer on to it. Did I do it or didn't yeah, I? Yeah, um, did. no, yeah, okay. I no, but um, <laughs> uh, the, the, okay. Now uh, I'll put in a plug for the um, um, this. Okay. Now, okay. Uh, that um, Springer is um, has turned out it published more Cousy's book than anybody else. And it does public, for example, that um, O and R series uh, on um, underwater acoustics, which um, uh, Jim had a book uh, with um, Boris and I forget what I remember. Anyway. Uh, and um, and Bill Carey has one. There was one with um, Sherman and the Butler, and there was one uh, with Richardson and um, Jackson. Um, and it was a nice little series. Anyway, um, the idea is that the ASA sort of encourages you to write the book. Um, we we say some nice things about it. Maybe uh, 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 Ben you some way, but you, you deal with Springer. You get the same reward as you get with Springer. And um, that you get our blessing when it's published. So it's um, seemed to me like a win-win thing. Um, and, um, and I was amazed because this gal at Springer, she started talking to people um, at the Montreal meeting. And, uh, and I gave her a bunch of names, um, mainly a metal winner, what you are, and, um, and so forth. And uh, a lot of them, yeah, a bit, a bit, they're, they're quite interested in writing a book. Um, um, I should also say that um, this is, uh, I went and started looking at you know, what books are there on acoustics, and the, um, there are a lot of books, um, but very few of them are written by ASA members, and most of the books written by ASA members, those members are dead. So, um, so I mean, you guys are doing great we research and everything, but you're not writing <laughs> books. Uh, uh, as, uh, well, that, that's true, but uh, but in, in the meanwhile, write a book or something. <laughs> yes. I'd like to follow up uh, Jim's question <clears throat> about uh, you know, the most novel work. Yeah. And, uh, in conversation, you mentioned problems in atomic physics, uh, specifically with the partridge block approximation. Yeah, yeah. And uh, that's a very current topic with the nuclear physics, and of course you've mentioned Born Oppenheimer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So was that part of your future? Um, well, I have um, all, all you guys um, probably had, and I have dreams of so forth. Um, and um, one, one of my dreams is to write a book which I might call quantum acoustics or so forth, yes. in which um, I would try to. You know, bring all the stuff in uh, quantum theory that applies to acoustics. And um, one of my um, irritations is that um, JASA doesn't get very many papers along those lines, and I thought maybe it's either shot. I mean, there, there obviously are papers, you know, by real physicists, uh, wherever, in other journals, but. Um, um, and, and, and go, uh, the, the tradition that was started by Bob Fire and so forth seems to have sort of pooped out right now. Okay. Anybody else have a? If not, well, thanks a lot. I appreciate yeah. it. It was yeah, kind of great.